Welcome to day one. <laughs> Yesterday would be day zero, of course. <laughs> Too early for that. Huh? Uh, how many of y'all made it out last night to the, uh, to the bar? Everybody have a good time? Yeah. Awesome. Who <laughs> expect this much for you, Marco? <laughs> I figured we'd start off, we start off our last day with a nice, soft, easy talk to kind of get everybody into the groove. So we have uh, Robert Luciani here to start us off with threading, uh, MN Threading and Dragonfly BSD. Sweet. Oops. All right, so um, this talk is a bit of an amalgamation of my bachelor's thesis from about a year ago. I, um, <clears throat> I was going to see if I could implement M to N threading on Dragonfly, because I heard that that was a good thing. Um, you didn't talk to them. No, I didn't talk to anybody. I just thought it sounded cool. And uh, all right, I have six months. Let's do this. Okay, so um, <clears throat> right, uh, the first part, the, my threading adventure, and the second part, uh, more dragonfly uh, related stuff. Um, yeah, I just want to clear up some things because everybody uses them in different ways, and this is the way I use them. Um, concurrency. What I mean by concurrency is wow, that fades really slow. A property that allows several vessels of execution to be run without a predefined order, uh, which makes sense. So if you think of threads and uh, you don't know if a reader thread is going to do something first or a writer thread, they're operating concurrently. So it's not really a, as much a function of time as it is about order, in my opinion. Um, then we talk about parallelism, which means that two things can run at the same time. Um, <clears throat> many problems that uh, programmers make with regards to these two uh, overlap, but uh, parallelism has introduced a bunch of new ones. So, um, uh, not, not in the least in the programming sense, but also in operating system uh, programmers that want to provide a platform for users to be able to run their programs in an optimal fashion. Um, I've been talking to some guys from Sweden in Erlang and stuff, and they're you know, providing a language that's supposed to provide lots of concurrency, and uh, we're sort of doing the same thing with threads, trying to provide the programmers with a platform to be able to use their hardware in an optimal fashion. So I think it's sort of the same problem, although they didn't agree, but we'll get to that later. All right. Um, the main conduits for program execution uh, generally speaking, are the process and the thread. The process encapsulate, encapsulates a uh, program, generally speaking, and is quite a lot bigger. Uh, has to keep track of a lot of things like um, yeah, file descriptors and user credentials, the ID of the program that's running. While a thread is a conduit that allows a program to split itself up within itself. Um, and we'll see that uh, these two can uh, don't have to have it's not such a, a rigorously defined uh, definition, but generally speaking, that's what it means. All right. Yes, they manifest themselves in two ways, kernel threads and user threads. One's from the kernel and one's from the user. And the user thread sees the kernel thread as an execution context. So they're uh, paired in that fashion. Um, all right, so <clears throat> we have threads on operating systems. And um, how do we uh, allow the user to exploit this concurrency or parallelism on the system? Um, wow, well, no, wait, let me go backwards. <laughs> there we go. All right, <clears throat> so there's a way of handling threads in the operating system known as M to 1, where you have uh, one kernel thread per process, and then within the process you can have uh, several user threads. And um, what happens because of this is that you can't have uh, you can't have several user threads uh, from the same process running on several CPUs. And uh, it's called process-wide contention because the threads uh, compete amongst themselves within the process. The next kind is the one that's become quite popular today called one-to-one -one system wide contention because each thread has its own kernel thread. And the implementation of how this is done can be done can be a little bit different from system to system. 
and it's system-wide contention because they all compete with each other on the system, even within the same process. So they're all competing for processor time. This allows the threads within the same process, as you see here, to uh, execute in parallel on two separate CPUs. Um, so the thing that I heard in the beginning was that uh, <clears throat> user threads um, are a lot faster than uh, that context switching between user threads are a lot faster than context switching between kernel threads and uh, having to jump down between the kernel and back up and back and forth uh, provide, er, causes a lot of work so I had read about this thing called M to N many people were trying it or had been trying it and uh, it's kernel support for user land threads. In other words, the kernel is aware of the threads that are up here, and you would have one scheduler here and here, and they would be cooperating to allow the fast context switches and other mechanisms all to be done in user land while still allowing parallelism. So, right. Dragonfly could be uh, improved, in my opinion, because uh, threads are faster than the processes in context switches. Didn't need to dive into the kernel. Uh, flexible contention scopes, right. <clears throat> in uh, the previous example where we had one-to-one, -one, uh, it's not always extremely obvious how you could have uh, different types of uh, priorities for the threads. Um, FreeBSD had a really advanced theory for how to solve this, but uh, with M10 and everybody talking back and forth, in theory you should be able to have them uh, cooperate in a way that would allow you to have real-time support, different levels of priority, and so forth. Um, right, and you could have uh, pluggable schedulers in user land. So you could just use a library to plug in a new scheduler uh, style or a, an aggressive scheduler or perhaps a, a more fair scheduler just by linking to a library in user land, which would be uh, easy for an administrator to do without having to use root privileges and other things. Um, the way I wanted to do it was using... Uh, an end to end theory called unstable threads, which came out uh, about a year after the scheduler activations concept. And uh, it's not really super different, but um, the uh, kernel is entirely in charge of when th kernel threads are created and killed. So <clears throat> a user process would uh, request a certain amount of parallelism, and uh, the uh, kernel would then spawn or kill threads. Um, it would they would communicate with each other using shared memory, which was supposed to be able to allow these two uh, schedulers and so forth to communicate without having to do context switches. So a kernel, uh, the kernel scheduler could uh, signal the usual, usual user scheduler that uh, a thread is uh, blocked in I.O. and write to the uh, communications area and allow the user scheduler to asynchronously... Um, schedule in or out other threads. Um, there was one theoretical setback, which was that uh, since it is asynchronous, um, it's up to the user scheduler to discover when there is a change and that could provide, uh, that could make, yeah, that could uh, lead to latency and so forth because the user scheduler had to discover it at a whim instead of having uh, quantas for scheduling in and out. Um, right, and like the scheduler act activations, there would be event notifier threads um, that would allow, uh, provide a new execution context for user threads to hop onto when uh, a thread would be stuck in the kernel from a page fault or, um, or, uh, or I.O. or something like that. So not super different, but uh, a little bit. <clears throat> Here we have, I talked a bit with David Budenhoff, and he felt that his variant was very successful, the one in... Uh, True 64. Um, yeah, it, it was a, a bit, it wasn't like schedule activations, but it did use a communication area to, uh, a shared memory communication area to uh, increase or decrease parallelism, and uh, he says it works. And I've heard some people say good things about it, but uh, now it's closed source, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, here's the longer list. Uh, AX used a system of uh, mapped 8 to 1 user threads, and then it would be uh, dynamically sized depending on how much parallelism was requested. Um, 
Solaris was implementing schedule activations for a long time and uh, wanted to keep going and going, but uh, after a while, um, it wasn't profitable. <laughs> uh, Linux was also trying to do schedule activations, but went over to one-to-one. -one. NetBSD, uh, FreeBSD, like I was saying, they had something called ske kernel schedule, scheduled entities, where um, it's they would have uh, more groupings on the kernel thread level, you could say, which would allow to have uh, system-wide contention between the threads and process-wide contention quite easily, allowing for things like real-time scheduling and other things, because <clears throat> you would have groups of kernel threads, um, you could say. And that way you could schedule the groups of kernel threads or you could schedule kernel threads individually. Um, it was quite sophisticated. Um, you could do things the Windows way, run everything in user land and code it in .NET, but that was out of the uh, scope of this project. Um, and that's about it. Um, well, for OSX, wouldn't you consider it to be threaded considering the kernel's mock? And that's pretty much what mock is. It's, yeah, it's one to one. It's P threads, regular one to one threads. They have lots of uh, user land threading utilities, though, several layers of it, even. So, um, yeah, and um, there's the airline way of doing things, doing everything in user land. They have a, uh, let's see. Right. Airline has, is essentially just a VM that you run the programs on, and it has um, one run queue per CPU, and then it has some logic for migrating the threads between CPUs and other things. Um, it doesn't use operating system threads. It uses coroutine-like uh, things it calls processes. Um, <clears throat> makes it lets you spawn millions of threads trivially. Uh, you know, you have a list. Uh, how do you sort it? Make a million threads and make them uh, sort it together. That's the way Erlang says you should do it. The, um, it had a bunch of cons. Um, message passing doesn't work very well because you have to send uh, very gigantic traffic between the processors. There's no way to use uh, shared memory with Erlang. It uh, doesn't work super well on heavy file I.O. Um, cooperative threads. Again, like M to N, if one thread is blocked, the entire process is blocked in the CPU. Can't do real time, because it's all in user land. Um, yeah, and not all problems are best solved by opening a gajillion TCP sockets and using up all the RAM, so. <laughs> right, there was a thread library in 2005, I think it was, shown at Usenix, which was sort of neat, I think. It was also done completely in user land, called uh, Capriccio. It used uh, Edgar Turning's coroutine libraries and was cooperatively scheduled. It was quite neat. Um, it was like Erlang in the sense that it could spawn hundreds of thousands of threads on commodity hardware and uh, was extremely fast in context switching. The ping pong tests, it would go five or six times faster than the uh, uh, Dragonfly one-to-one -one or the NPTL. Um, <clears throat> but it never implemented support for SMP that was on the to-do list of the paper, so, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, Just for four years. Huh? Just for four years. Four, <laughs> to the power of, yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it was sort of funny, it had this graph. Uh, it was a logarithmic scale, so when you got to the bottom, it only looked like it performed this much worse than the other threading libraries, but it was like a magnitude of 10, so on low concurrency, it had quite low, low I.O. Uh, performance. And um, they noticed that uh, using cooperative uh, scheduling, they had to um, take away, they had to modify certain programs like Apache, which had little delays when waiting for things like connecting to sockets and other things. So it didn't really work without also making the programs a bit aware that they need to be cooperatively scheduled. So uh, I decided I was still going to go ahead and try this, but. Um, I was, uh, while I was implementing the uh, idea, I did lots of benchmarks and other things, micro benchmarks, to see that uh, the concepts uh, were sound. And um, here I uh, have a little graph that I made, and we can see that user thread context switching has a, a uh, distinct advantage, although not gargantuan in scale. We can see that uh, this is a weighted history graph. So of the uh, 10,000 context switches, uh, all of the ones, all of the user threads, the context switch ended up in uh, the sub one microsecond uh, time. And we see that it uh, differs a little bit for kernel threads, depending. But they're not so far after. Um, 
diving into the kernel back and forth uh, takes uh, longer than not diving into the kernel. Um, so, um, yeah, that was obvious. But uh, <laughs> problems that arose. <clears throat> CPU-bound workloads didn't perform enough context switches. I was thinking that perhaps databases which have a lot of in-cached data would perhaps be able to do the massive amount of context switching required. It depends a lot on the programmer. If you want to have a program that spawns 100,000 threads to solve something like, like Erlang does, or if you do things with libevent in C. Um, so I, I couldn't find many cases where uh, programs were doing enough context switches besides the ping pong tests where uh, that small delay would really make a big difference, uh, which also leads to the next part. Uh, uh, even, even if they did perform a little bit faster, there were other delays in the programs that overshadowed that minute uh, one microsecond advantage that ha context switching in user land always gave. Um, and, and it became a lot of scheduling complexities because uh, sometimes you, if the kernel sees that there's I.O., it just uh, schedules on another thread. Everything can be done in one place. While here it would go down, see that there's I.O., go back up, schedule it out. Oh, the I.O. is done. Go back up again, schedule it back on, schedule out the kernel. Yeah, okay, so it would be uh, many unnecessary steps, which would lead to more context switching than, uh, than we wanted. The entire point was to skip the context switching and the diving in and out of the kernel. So it defeated the purpose in a lot of uh, instances. Um, handling input-output was also a big uh, boo-boo. Um, the first idea was to upcall from the kernel when, when I.O. was done. And um, yeah, again, uh, there's no point to going up and down a million times because M10 is not supposed to, or is supposed to uh, get rid of that problem. Um, the next idea was perhaps to use KQ like Capriccio used, and it worked well in high concurrency situations, but um, uh, yeah, it, it's quite hefty to uh, do it uh, all using KQ. Um, it, it's magnitudes, orders of magnitudes, orders simpler to just let it be one to one and let the kernel handle all the scheduling. Um, another idea that Matt Dillon came up with was to use shared memory. FIFO transfer and receive queues, and it was sort of nifty, but we couldn't come up with any way to uh, uh, to do it well because yeah, like you see, um, during burst the I/O, uh, the kernel needed to be kicked back on to see that there was something on the queue, and uh, it, it became a lot more complicated than expected. <clears throat> Many lessons learned from this project. Um, <clears throat> Right, interacting with the MMU, the hottest topic, the one that everybody knows about now. Um, I looked up a bit in the Intel uh, documentation and found these numbers, which I thought was interesting. It's not really a performance hit there, but I didn't know what to write afterwards. Uh, if you take 2,500 cycles to process a P TCP packet in uh, register lookup or L3 cache lookup, it uh, goes really fast. My biggest surprise when doing this project was learning how many bugs there are in uh, today's processors. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and uh, for instance, the invalidate page, which uh, sometimes, but not always, you know, clears the entire translation look aside buffer, depending on uh, the weather and uh, other, uh, you know, defining factors. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, mapping on mapping memory like uh, mock does in the kernel for every single message and other sort of things. Uh, is quite hefty and it leads to like a 16% uh, overhead. So not a good idea again. Um, right. And, and because of this, uh, jumping back and forth between the user land scheduler and the kernel thread, uh, kernel scheduler, uh, you would lose things like cache affinity. So uh, yes, my conclusion after six months, stick one to one. <laughs> And uh, we had a one-to-one -one, uh, thread library that just got imported. I think we stole most of it from FreeBSD, but uh, uh, Simon um, Schubert worked a lot with it, and I think uh, Jeffrey Sue worked with it, and uh, it works really well. We, ha we have most of the kinks worked out. It's very fast. Um, the way our threading system in Dragonfly works right now is uh, the following way. 
Um, we have P threads, and they're connected to lightweight processes. And the lightweight process is, in effect, quite light because all of the uh, process information is contained in a separate struct, and uh, it allows us, for example, to have the same PID for uh, several threads as opposed to Linux, which has one PID for every thread and those sorts of things. Um, and the uh, implementation was quite elegant. The next part is each uh, lightweight process is connected to a lightweight kernel thread, which are very lightweight, and uh, the lightweight kernel threads are scheduled in round robin and can have their own priorities. So um, right now we only have one user mode scheduler, which is the BSD scheduler with a few tweaks now because uh, also one of those XMMS scrolling issues where <laughs> somebody was complaining and uh, uh, Matt and a few others went in and uh, fixed it a bit. Um, last summer of code, we were going to do a stride scheduling uh, user land scheduler, and it got finished, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, I haven't heard any news about it. Um, it was submitted, and that was that. Four years. Yeah, four years again. Uh, so we still have the BSD scheduler, and uh, I was discussing a bit and asking how we could use uh, real-time threads, and um, we have a pluggable scheduler framework, so it would be very trivial to have an extra scheduler uh, for real-time threads, an extra run queue here, and you could connect uh, the real-time threads to an extra lightweight kernel thread and give it higher priority in the lightweight kernel thread uh, run queue. So uh, it would have uh, quite tight bounds on latency and so forth. I think that's sort of neat. Um, what else? Right, lightweight kernel threads. It's, it's sort of a microkernel, or it is a microkernel. And uh, the lightweight kernel threads communicate with each other using messages. This is a bit how Dragonfly handles concurrency internally. Um, they're not as hefty as the uh, mock kernel threads because they don't map and unmap memory. And uh, they only require a short critical section when operating on the same CPU. It's, there's uh, an inbox and an outbox. And um, they send IPI messages back and forth if uh, they want to send a message to another CPU. The IPIs can be batched because they're not always super fast. And um, yeah, um, there are many systems that use it right now. Uh, amongst others, we, because we forked off from FreeBSD 4.9, we didn't uh, reap any of the advantages of the SMPNG um, revolution. And uh, Matt thought it would be neat to um, use messages and uh, several other, or explore messages and other techniques to uh, try and achieve concurrency. So uh, <clears throat> the, the latest part to, uh, to be, uh, that, that's be, that has the big giant lock removed from it is the uh, kernel stack, and, uh, kernel stack, the network stack, and uh, done by Aglos also as his uh, master's thesis. Uh, let's see here, almost MP safe. It's almost completely done. Um, there is one kernel thread per CPU, uh, and um, it's nearly lock-free with the help of this message, message passing. Um, yeah, let's see. There's lots of interesting stuff I can say about it. Um, there were some, uh, well, anyway. There are, uh, there are some issues with inter-process communication right now, uh, but on the grand scale of things, it seems to work quite well. And the initial tests uh, suggest that there is uh, uh, excellent performance to be gained. Um, I think it's sort of neat that uh, we could test this different paradigm and get it to work. And, um, you know, uh, fine grain locking has been uh, proven and is very high performance, as we all know from FreeBSD 7. Um, but at the same time, it's fun to try new things, which is a little bit why I got started with BSD. Um, so this version seems to work, and hopefully in the coming BSD conference, uh, Agilos or Matt or somebody else will be able to give some concrete numbers on how well it works. Um, and that's uh, about what I had to say on the network stack. This is just uh, my reasons for running Dragonfly. I know not everybody has had the chance to explore Dragonfly. 
uh, hammer. Uh, this all 20 users, we use it. <clears throat> it's really good. It saved my butt a few times, most recently before I came here to uh, the U.S. Um, in conjunction with V kernels, which are uh, the kernels that can run entirely in user mode and they boot in a couple of seconds. Really nice. They're not tuned for high performance, again, because we're only 20 people. Um, but, uh, you know, I host my site on it, and there was an update to PAM and something else, and NFS stopped working, and a bunch of things got messed up, and uh, with Hammer, I just rolled back and rebooted the old V kernel, and it was uh, super handy. And it's also good when you're editing uh, config files for uh, uh, some phone program that you've just installed, and then you can't remember what you had 20 configs, uh, or 20 changes ago, and it lets you roll back. So that's also pretty useful. Uh, yeah, I use it also because I can plug and unplug the USB stick, which I do when I'm bored. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's such a small team that, uh, that uh, your voice can be heard, which is also nice. Although I've heard that you all are very receptive to new ideas and so forth, too. Um, what are you pointing at us? Huh? What are you pointing at us? Uh, <laughs> I'm a newcomer. Um, so yeah, so that's about the end of my talk. Um, I'm not the most experienced kernel hacker, but if you have any other questions, I'll answer them to the best of my abilities. Yeah? So you were talking about benchmarks you were trying to run on M10. Mm. Did you, I, I don't know if Dragonfly has Java. I read that. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah. So you know the kernel schedule activations in KSE were done to handle specifically Java-like uses of the system? Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't aware. Explode out. I mean, Java programmers will often explode out a huge number of threads yeah. at the beginning of, the, of their run, uh -huh. and that's kind of the, the, the thing it goes after. Well, so, <coughs> that would have been the thing that we might have shown better before. So the other question I have is, how large was the implementation you wanted to fill? Um, it was more on the level, it wasn't a fully functioning thread library, it was more on the level that I tried to uh, get some, uh, I tried to implement the uh, some of the sub-features like the shared memory communication and uh, a few of those parts. The, the reason we took KSE out of <coughs> FreeBSD wasn't that it was complete. Mm. It was that you know, there, were, there were issues with it. But the biggest issue was that it made the scheduler, the kernel side scheduler, impossible to work with. Because mm. there was just a huge amount of state and a huge amount of code required to get that right. And the other thing was that one-to-one -one basically went out the market. Yeah. Like most people who are doing stuff do it with one-to-one, -one, and we were carrying around this huge amount of code that wasn't being used by the majority of our users. I couldn't, <coughs> schedule, schedule really I couldn't find anywhere why AX had switched, other than it said due to uh, high demand and the same thing. So I think it was getting in. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, but I think that at the same time, there were very many people that kept on thinking that the more time we spend on it, uh, you know, we can make it work, you know, after four or five years if we just put more people on it and more code. And uh, I think it was good that uh, we gave up after a while. And I learned my lesson. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Dragonfly, cool if you, uh, you want to try a new little project and uh, maybe get it uh, implemented quickly. Um, new developers are welcome. I think all 20 of us are developers, and then there are like 10 testers that try the live CD. The live CD is quite neat. Uh, my sister worked on it last summer in the Google Summer of Code. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's the entire environment, and it just gets copied straight over to disk, so it's sort of neat. Um, yeah, that's it for me.